Hi, and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision Session with me, Christine. So today's lesson, I want to look at the use of microorganisms in biotechnology. So let's just remind ourselves that microorganisms like fungi, yeast, and bacteria, or their enzymes, are used to make, break down, or change materials to help humans. So it's important that we remember that microorganisms have a very short life cycle and they also have this rapid growth rate. The nutrients that they require are often very simple so therefore relatively cheap. So if they're going to ask questions about this they will be expecting you to give advantages for and against some of the examples. Also, we can genetically manipulate microorganisms. So I'm going to give you a few examples, but you do need to note they, that you're not expected to recall these, okay? It's been removed from your specification. The new specification is more about you understanding how to apply the knowledge. So corn is an example of a single cell protein. It's a fungus which is grown in large fermenters. So that would link back to batch or continuous fermentation. Now the food source that they are given is glucose syrup. And what they will do is they will use that to help them to grow and to make more of themselves and also to help them to do their metabolic pathways. Now after they've been grown to a large number what's then occurring is that they are added to albumin to egg white and then they're pressed together and that will increase the texture and the flavour for people who are looking for a meat substitution who don't eat animal products but do want something which is made from this fungus. Another thing that we can use microorganisms for is what's known as bioremediation. Now, this one is a really interesting one because this isn't to produce food, but what it is to do is microorganisms will break down pollutants and contaminants in the soil, in the water. Now, it's important that you remember that microorganisms have got DNA, that DNA can be transcribed and translated, and that can produce proteins. Now different proteins, different enzymes will be able to break down different materials. So microorganisms are also sometimes known as decomposers because they can break down molecules, substances that are left, these waste products that are left. So therefore the fact that they can break down these pollutants and contaminants are waste in soil, in water, and then use them to grow, that is an example of where the process of using them to break something down or using them to make something. So it could be that they're being used to break down the pollutants and the contaminants, but then potentially being used to grow and produce the corn. So it will be very much a application question if they're going to look at the example. So I'm going to give you a few more where the application is more to do with your topic areas of module five. So let's look at example of baking. So when you are baking, if you have ever baked, you will tend to use yeast. So we're going to use the microorganism, this fungi, this eukaryotic organism. And what that can do is that can do aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So we provide the yeast with flour and water. And what will then happen is that yeast will be able to break down the polysaccharides, which are inside the flour, making them the monosaccharides, the glucose, which can then be used for aerobic or anaerobic respiration if all the oxygen has been removed. Now the key thing to remember is whether it's aerobically respiring or anaerobically respiring it's going to be producing carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide is actually what makes the dough rise. Where does the carbon dioxide come from? Well if we're looking at aerobic respiration it will be the decarboxylation from the link reaction and the decarboxylation from the Krebs cycle. If we're looking at it with anaerobic respiration it will be with the ethanol fermentation but still the decarboxylation 
when the pyruvate is converted into ethanol. So this is where they're going to be linking this with your module five respiration topic area. Now, obviously, once you have your bread risen to the point that you're happy with it, you will then bake it in the oven and that's going to kill those yeast cells. So therefore, that should kill those microorganisms that were useful at the time so that you are then going to obviously eat the bread. Now, the key thing to note here is if they were anaerobically respiring and they were producing ethanol, what will happen with that ethanol is when you bake it in the oven, that will result in that being evaporated off. So you're told not to eat the raw dough because it is actually fermenting if it's been left for a long period of time, but also there could be other substances like bacteria that will be in the flour naturally. So when you look at the bread, when you cut it open, whatever bread you're looking at, and you see those gaps, those bubbles of carbon dioxide, as they were being cooked in the oven, those gas bubbles were actually starting to expand and that expansion is what makes your dough really soft and fluffy. But as I said before, you've got to be careful and remember that if you are using flour for making your bread, yes, we're adding the yeast in it, but actually naturally in the flour, there are microorganisms like lactic acid bacteria. Now, if you've ever done sourdough starters, what you'll know is you put yeast flour and water in a container, and in that container, they will then go through the fermentation process. That lactic acid bacteria is going to use the flour and hydrolyze it down, break it down to make it into a substance that it requires. It's a lactic acid bacteria, so it's going to make lactic acid. That is what actually adds flavor and texture if you've ever eaten sourdough bread. So it's important that we note that we can add these microorganisms in, but some are found naturally within the example. So whenever they give the, you a question, Remember, it's about linking it together with our other topic areas. Cheese making is another example. We've got bacteria, it's going to convert lactose, a disaccharide, into lactic acid. That is then going to make it acidic. That's going to add to the flavor. We put enzymes in there that are going to add to this coagulation. The milk is going to form these curds, which are solid parts. So. Remember, they are proteins. Where did those proteins come from? Those proteins are going to be produced by the organism that it's coming from. We are talking about goat cheese in this example. It could be cow's milk. It could be any type of milk. If we're looking at this coagulation, we're looking at these proteins which are changing their tertiary structure. Now, if you've ever had soft cheese, why is it soft compared to the hard goat's cheese that I have here? Well, that's to do with how much liquid it has in it. If they press it down more, they're going to remove more liquid. That's what gets you your hard cheese. And if it's soft, it's still retaining that liquid part. So it's important to note with this whole example, it will never be about you memorizing them, it will be about how you can apply those other topic areas. Yogurt's prime example of a bacteria, a microorganism that's been added, which is going to change this texture, change the consistency of the proteins inside the yogurts. So yogurt production, as you can see here in my goat's milk yogurt, there are five active bacteria which are inside that yogurt and that is therefore going to be producing its own polymers and those polymers are going to be released extracellular polymers. So that's a way of you understanding that exocytosis is going to happen in the fact that they will release these polymers out and these polymers are going to then affect that texture and that taste. 
brewing. If we're going to use brewing as an example, you've got yeast again, who are anaerobically respiring, respiration, producing ethanol. What else do we have? Well, what we actually have to realize is it links to germination. When we take, for example, malt, what we're talking about is a seed which is going to be germinating. When it germinates, it provides enzymes and sugars, and then the yeast will be able to do that anaerobic respiration using those sugars that have already been released through the process of the germination that occurred in the seed. And obviously looking at the hormones involved in that germination, that water with the seed will result in it being activated for the gibberellin. So they can find a way to link this all together, thinking about the bigger picture. Now, penicillin production is a prime example of a semi continuous batch process where you've got a bioreactor at about 25 to 27 degrees C with a pH which is controlled at 6.5. Now this penicillin production is a secondary metabolite, a secondary metabolite which is produced by the fungi to kill any pathogenic bacteria that may be surrounding it. So this is where you have to remember that what we're looking for is we want to stop it from actually getting to that death phase. We need that secondary metabolite and therefore we stop the process before it continues on to the death phase. So the fact that it's a semi-continuous batch, we're constantly adding in the nutrients and we should be removing some of the products that are being made along with the culture and therefore allowing for the continual production of penicillin. Another one is the insulin production and the fact that genetically engineered treatment for type 1 diabetes, going back to our module 5 on hormonal system, we have to remember that insulin type 1 diabetes is where our beta cells are not actually producing the insulin that is required to maintain our blood glucose levels. So therefore, we can use insulin production through genetically engineering bacterial cells, microorganisms to produce the necessary protein, the insulin. Now, the key thing that they're going to actually ask you to do is either linking it to those other topic areas or asking you to do the arguments for and against. So if we're gonna use these microorganisms to make the food, so we're not talking about genetically engineering insulin, we're not talking about bioremediation here, we're talking about the bread making, the yogurts, the cheese, the microproteins in corn. If we're going to use microorganisms to make the food, what are the advantages? Well, it's a faster reproduction, it's a microorganism. They go through that process a lot quicker and they have a faster production of their proteins. Now, it's important when you're giving advantages that you're saying it is faster than the likes of getting them from animals or plants. There is a higher protein content in the food that is provided through using these microorganisms. Also, we can use waste materials as they produce more enzymes. So we can actually grow the microorganisms on waste material because they can produce these enzymes, they can break it down. So that is an advantage. We can genetically modify them, but disadvantage, we can actually result in food that is containing toxins because microorganisms produce toxins. So this is a disadvantage of us using these microorganisms to make food for human consumption. The separation process. Now, if we're doing batch or continuous fermentation, we have to separate from the nutrient broth, we also need to process the materials that are being produced. Well, that costs money, that takes time, that takes skills. So therefore, that is a disadvantage. 
also we need those sterile conditions required. Again, that's the cost. It's going to be very expensive because we need to ensure that we have none of the microorganisms that could cause pathogenic diseases. Also, people have concerns about genetically modified organisms that they're not quite sure what or how it's going to affect later on down the line. And the other thing is that actually any food that's made through using these microorganisms tends to have little flavour. So because of that, a lot of additives need to be given to give the food flavour. So the fact that it needs these additives, the colouring or the flavour, means that it's a disadvantage of us using these microorganisms. So the key thing to remember is you don't have to memorise any of the examples, but they will expect you to understand if they give you some information how this interlinks to the other topic areas. So I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel and if you haven't done so already please do check out my revision platform www.aiqchat.com.